quantum computers didn't fail because the physics was wrong. They failed because nobody could build them at scale. For over a decade, quantum computing hit the same wall. Every company, every lab, every attempt to go beyond a few dozen qubits crashed into the same problem, wires. Every additional qubit needed its own control cables running into a refrigerator colder than outer space. More qubits meant more wires. More wires meant more heat leaking in. More heat meant more errors. More errors meant the whole system collapsed. It wasn't a physics problem anymore. It was an engineering nightmare. The machines weren't failing because quantum mechanics was impossible. They were failing because the infrastructure to control them was impossible to scale. And then, in January 2026, something changed. D-Wave Quantum announced they had solved one of the most stubborn problems in the field. They moved the control electronics, the fragile circuitry that talks to qubits, inside the cryogenic environment itself, right next to the quantum chip. No explosion of cables, no exponential complexity scaling. The bottleneck that made large quantum systems impractical was addressed. This wasn't about building a faster quantum computer. This wasn't about cramming in more qubits. This was something different. Quantum computing crossed from a physics problem into an engineering problem. And when that happens in technology, timelines collapse. Because once a breakthrough becomes buildable, the question stops being if it works and becomes who builds it first. To understand why this matters, you need to understand the problem quantum computing has been hiding in plain sight. Every quantum computer has to bridge two incompatible worlds. One world is ultra-cold, within a fraction of a degree above absolute zero, where quantum bits stay stable enough to compute. The other world is room temperature, where normal electronics live. For years, these worlds were connected by thousands of physical wires threading into a massive refrigeration system. Each new qubit meant more cables threading through the temperature gradient. More cables meant more pathways for heat to leak in. More heat meant qubits lost their quantum properties faster. This created an exponential scaling wall. Going from 50 qubits to 500 wasn't just 10 times harder. It became physically impractical. The refrigeration system itself became the limiting factor. Here's the key contrast. D-Wave's quantum annealing systems already control tens of thousands of qubits using approximately 200 bias control lines. 200, not thousands. That's why annealing systems reached five-digit qubit counts, while gate model systems, the kind needed for general quantum algorithms, stalled at double digits. Gate-based quantum computers didn't fail because the qubits were worse. They failed because every qubit needed its own dedicated control infrastructure. Engineers knew the solution conceptually. Move control electronics closer to the qubits, ideally right inside the cryogenic environment. But implementing this at temperatures near absolute zero is extraordinarily difficult. Electronics behave completely differently in extreme cold. Power dissipation becomes critical. Signal integrity becomes fragile. For years, this problem refused to yield. That's what makes the January 20th on 26 announcement significant. D-Wave demonstrated scalable cryogenic control electronics for gate model quantum systems. They didn't just add more qubits. They changed the control architecture itself, borrowing the scaling approach that made annealing systems successful and applying it to gate-based computing. They didn't try to optimize around the wall. They moved the wall. Because once gate model quantum computers stop needing thousands of individual control wires, scaling stops being a physics fantasy and starts looking like a manufacturing roadmap. So what exactly did D-Wave prove in January 2026? They demonstrated scalable on-chip cryogenic control electronics for gate model quantum computing, specifically designed to work with fluxonium qubits. That detail matters. Fluxonium qubits are different from the superconducting qubits that dominated early quantum computing. They're a newer architecture that trades operational speed for stability. Fluxonium qubits maintain their quantum properties for much longer. Their coherence times are orders of magnitude better. Longer coherence means fewer errors. Fewer errors means more useful computation. 
but fluxonium qubits are also harder to control precisely. That control challenge is what stalled their adoption. D-Wave showed that the sophisticated electronics needed to manipulate and measure fluxonium qubits can operate directly inside the cryogenic environment, on or adjacent to the quantum chip itself, without introducing excessive heat or electrical noise. This wasn't a one-time laboratory demonstration. It was a repeatable, scalable control architecture. Notice what they didn't claim. They didn't announce hundreds of new qubits overnight. They didn't claim fault-tolerant quantum computing is solved. They didn't promise quantum advantage tomorrow. What they demonstrated was removal of a fundamental blocker. This is the difference between a demonstration and an inflection point. Fluxonium qubits were already known to have better stability and lower error rates, but only in small numbers. The missing piece was scalable control infrastructure. That's the piece D-Wave addressed. Think of early semiconductor history. The breakthrough wasn't discovering that silicon could switch. It was learning how to manufacture, wire, power, and control millions of transistors reliably on a single integrated circuit. That's the parallel here. Because once stable qubits like fluxonium can be controlled at scale, the question stops being whether quantum systems work and becomes how quickly they can be deployed. Most emerging technologies fail not because the fundamental science is wrong, but because practical engineering never catches up. Quantum computing has existed in that gap for years. Brilliant theory, fragile implementations. Cryogenic on-chip control changes that dynamic. When control electronics live outside the cryogenic system, progress is linear and slow. Every improvement requires redesigning the entire control stack. Iteration cycles are long. Debugging is difficult. But when control moves on chip, progress becomes iterative and modular. Engineers can improve density, power efficiency, and signal quality generation by generation following the same improvement curves that drove classical semiconductor progress. This is how technological timelines compress. Instead of waiting decades for a perfect, fully fault-tolerant quantum computer, the industry can now build imperfect but scalable systems sooner. And history consistently shows that imperfect systems, once scalable, improve far faster than perfect systems that never leave the laboratory. That's the critical shift. The question isn't whether today's quantum machines solve every problem. The question is whether they're now practically buildable. Because once a technology becomes buildable, economic forces take over. Investment increases, talent flows in, manufacturing improves, the technology compounds on itself. And when economics enters the equation, quantum computing stops being an academic research race and starts becoming a strategic competition. The first beneficiaries of scalable quantum computing won't be consumers. They won't be app developers. They won't even be startups chasing venture funding. They'll be governments, defense organizations, and industries where computational advantage translates directly into strategic power. And there's an important detail that changes how this breakthrough should be understood. The multi-chip quantum control package demonstrated in this announcement wasn't fabricated in a typical corporate laboratory. It was built at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That matters significantly. JPL doesn't build experimental hardware for publicity. It builds systems that must operate reliably under extreme conditions, integrate into mission-critical infrastructure, and function for years without failure. When JPL is involved in developing a technology, it signals that the problem being solved is operational, not just theoretical. This reframes what the breakthrough actually represents. Scalable quantum systems don't need to be commercially successful to be strategically valuable. They need to be predictable, repeatable, and controllable. That's sufficient to provide advantages in logistics optimization, materials discovery, signal processing, and cryptographic research. With on-chip cryogenic control and aerospace-grade manufacturing capability, quantum systems transition from laboratory curiosity to deployable research infrastructure. System uptime improves. Experimental iteration cycles shorten. Integration with classical computing systems becomes routine. 
That's when Quantum stops being a moonshot project. It becomes something more consequential, strategic infrastructure. And once quantum computing becomes infrastructure, the advantage doesn't announce itself. It shows up as someone quietly pulling ahead. This needs to be stated clearly because this is where misleading hype typically enters. Quantum computers are not about to replace GPUs, CPUs, or classical data centers. They won't run video games. They won't serve web traffic. They won't train large language models end to end. And they don't need to. Quantum systems don't compete with classical computers on general purpose tasks. They address specific problem classes that are fundamentally difficult to solve with classical computation, regardless of how much hardware you throw at them. Optimization problems with enormous solution spaces, sampling from complex probability distributions, simulating quantum mechanical systems, searching through combinatorial possibilities. These are the quiet bottlenecks behind modern AI workflows, drug discovery, materials science and logistics planning. Think of it this way. GPUs excel at performing massive amounts of well-defined mathematical operations very quickly. Quantum systems are useful when the problem itself is uncertain, combinatorial, or grows exponentially in complexity. One doesn't replace the other. They compress different parts of the computational pipeline. That's why this breakthrough matters even if quantum machines remain specialized tools. Once scalable control infrastructure exists, quantum processes can be integrated into hybrid computational pipelines. Classical systems handle what they're optimized for. Quantum systems handle what they're uniquely suited for. This doesn't eliminate the existing computational stack. It augments it from underneath. And once the stack gets augmented, the advantage doesn't appear in headlines. It appears as incremental superiority compounding over time. This is where the narrative shifts from technology to power. Startups chase markets and consumer applications. Governments chase asymmetric advantage. Scalable quantum systems don't need commercial success to be strategically valuable. They need to be controllable, repeatable, and capable of providing advantage in areas that matter for long-term competition. That's sufficient to shift outcomes in logistics planning, intelligence analysis, materials research, and cryptographic development in subtle but decisive ways. This is why most quantum breakthroughs don't arrive with consumer product announcements. They arrive quietly, absorbed into national laboratories, defense research programs, and strategic technology pipelines. The advantage isn't visible to the public. It's visible in planning speed, discovery timelines, and long-term positioning. Cryogenic on-chip control matters strategically because it transforms quantum systems from rare demonstrations into operational research assets. Once control complexity decreases, system reliability improves, experimental throughput increases, integration with existing infrastructure becomes practical. That's when quantum transitions from aspirational moonshot to functioning infrastructure and infrastructure advantages compound silently. The country or organization that integrates quantum capabilities into their research and development cycles first doesn't need to announce it. They simply begin moving faster in key areas. Discovery cycles shorten, optimization improves, long-term planning becomes more precise. By the time the advantage becomes obvious to outside observers, the gap has already widened. But there's one remaining question that determines whether this changes everything or just quietly rearranges the competitive landscape. This breakthrough doesn't mean quantum computing is complete. It doesn't mean the world changes overnight. What it means is more subtle and more significant. For the first time, one of quantum computing's most fundamental unsolved engineering problems transitioned from being a fundamental blocker to being a solvable roadmap control infrastructure moved closer to the qubits. System complexity decreased. Scaling stopped looking theoretically impossible. That single shift changes how the next decade unfolds. Quantum computing won't arrive as a dramatic revolution announced in press releases. It will arrive quietly, embedded into optimization pipelines, research workflows, and strategic systems long before most people notice.
The countries and institutions that integrate it early won't announce their advantage. They'll simply operate with slightly better logistics. Discover materials slightly faster. Plan with slightly better precision. And history demonstrates clearly that this is how technological power actually shifts. Not with explosions, not with announcements, but with small structural advantages that compound year after year until the gap becomes unbridgeable. So the actual question isn't whether quantum computing is ready in some absolute sense. The question is whether the broader world is paying attention to the moment when it transitioned from physics research to engineering development. Because once a technology crosses that threshold, it doesn't wait for consensus or permission. It just keeps scaling. And by the time everyone agrees it matters, the advantage is already established. If you want clear, evidence-based analysis of technologies quietly reshaping global competition, from quantum computing to AI to semiconductor manufacturing, subscribe for more content like this. And share your perspective. Do you think quantum computing will impact AI development first or cryptographic security?